In this episode, I'm talking with Cedric Reeves. Cedric is a meditation teacher and also recently started teaching attachment repair courses that are focused on helping you move from insecure attachments to secure attachments, which helps with romantic relationships, but also with general emotional processing and your ability to and interest in exploring things, being curious about the world and trying new things. Uh, I've been taking Cedric's courses and also sat some retreats with him and just been really enjoying the work that he's putting out there and the different materials that he has and getting to know him a little bit. So I wanted to dive deeper into his own history with meditation practice, attachment repair, and share a little bit of that with you. Um, we talk mostly about meditation for the first third or so of the conversation and then more about the attachment repair towards the uh, last two thirds of the conversation. So hope you enjoy this. Uh, would love to hear any feedback that you have and definitely check out Cedric's courses. Hi, Cedric. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah. Hey, hey, Tashin. It's a pleasure. Uh, so I mentioned this, but um, I'm really hoping to talk about two, two big topics. One is your history with meditation and then also um, your current work with attachment repair, mm -hmm. both how you got into that and your course offerings and um, but hoping to start with the meditation stuff. So um, can you tell me just a bit about your background with meditation and practice and how you got interested in all this stuff? Sure, sure. Um, okay, so let's see. I think I was always, you know, curious and then like a little bit kind of philosophically interested, but then also I was, you know, unhappy, I think quite a bit, you know, and I'd say like kind of, if, um, what's the word here? Internally conflicted. And I just didn't feel settled. So, but, you know, I also think I was the type of person that would like my, ex, my inclinations to explore were good. So I was always trying to figure, figure something out. And then um, I remember I was 17 and my mom and I had like some big fight or something. And, um, and she's like, well, let's, and she was, she had started psychotherapy. I don't know, maybe a year before. And she's like, well, um, let's, let's have a meeting where you come into psychotherapy with me and talk about this. And then I'm like, okay, sure, whatever. Um, <laughs> I remember, incidentally, my, my perspective on this is I'm going to, I'm going to like, you know, let the therapist know how screwed up she is uh -huh. Uh -huh. in a real kind of self-righteous way. Anyway, so we went in and, um, and then, you know, the therapist said to me kind of towards the end of our session, it's like, well, you know, I think you'd really benefit from psychotherapy or something like, yeah, sure. Great. Uh, because, you know, I was like really, um, I mean, I was interested in all these things. I was interested in maybe getting better, but I was also like, I, I think I kind of had like a real sense of like invalidation that I kind of carried. And I, and I was like constantly chafing against that, you know? And so then get going into psychotherapy and being able to like present my side of it and like kind of get that validated was like something that really appealed to me. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so, I got all going with psychotherapy. I did that, you know, weekly for like with that particular therapist, for, like seven years straight. I like really dedicated, really obsessed with it. Um, I did like lots of journaling, just trying to figure out all my problems. Uh, you know, then I got to college, I studied business and then I, uh, uh, anyway, so I, I ended up moving to Chile and then I was pretty miserable there. And then, because I was like, like what I, you know, I kind of thought that, oh, my primary interest is business. And, and, and that kind of is the case. I like business. But then, like, I, I just needed this, like, self-help and this, like, support that I just couldn't find in Chile. So then I moved back with the intention to, like, um, become a psychotherapist. So then I went and got a second. I started with a second undergraduate in psychology with that plan in mind. And then I took a class by Edward Taub. Um, he was like one of the old, like one of the, I think original TM guys, like original people uh, that got involved with TM right at the beginning when, uh, uh, gosh, what is it? Uh, Mahesh Yogi um, came over to the US. And so it was, it was like a three hour academic course that like really went into the nuts and bolts of um, meditation from like a you know and of course this is like 15 years ago so the science wasn't as far but like you know there was you know he referenced studies 
he said that awakening was real like particularly he said like enlightenment is real and then you get it through meditation i'm like what and like i was you know uh i can't, I, I was always just desperate for like a hard solution like i was looking for <laughs> i mean i was looking for salvation in the uh in the crudest term in the in the crudest sense of the word you know and so i started meditating and like i noticed that that like just you know, let's say within a week, I had had experiences that felt more healing and more important than all the work I'd done in, in psychotherapy. And because that had been my kind of salvational vehicle that I'd clung to prior to that. And then so now I changed vehicles and got interested in meditation. So anyway, so I, I got, I was quite into meditation, but I didn't have a teacher. My mental health was generally not real good. And so I didn't get you know, the support, the support I needed to like really be really consistent. I mean, there were long stretches of time where I'd meditate a lot, like two hours a day, et cetera, but I wasn't doing a lot of retreat anyway. So I kind of got, oh, and then my plan at that point was to ordain. Um, uh, but anyway, so that didn't happen because in my mind I had school debt and I'm like, oh, I got to pay this off first. So then I try to get work to pay that off and you know how that goes. So um, I ended up moving to Miami. I got a girlfriend. Um, I also ended up starting um, some businesses. And then at some point, about five years later, you know, I hadn't really maintained my practice, although it was still on and on again, off again. And I just Rick, really had a kind of mental health breakdown. Um, you know, like I was so depressed, so anxious, like I was also starting to have like a cognitive decline. Like, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but like, if you get really, really depressed, uh, like like your short-term memory really starts failing. And like, I, I couldn't think straight. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I remember like, so it, my work that I'd been doing right before I founded the company was as a child protective investigator. So I was investigating child abuse for the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And I spoke good Spanish, but I remember that one, I was interviewing some parents about um, alleged abuse or neglect or abandonment of their children. And it, it was a Spanish speaking family and I was speaking Spanish. And the person like actually commented like, wow, your Spanish is bad. <laughs> and, it, and like, it was because like, I was so depressed that like, I'd had like this like cognitive decline where I couldn't even speak Spanish well. And like, that was a little bit of a wake up call anyway. So, but then I, I started meditating a little bit more. Then I was getting into precious metals and then I, I kind of like felt like this big coin deal fell into my lap. So I ended up doing this coin deal. And then this old, I mean, I'm kind of giving you a lot of background here, but then a friend of mine who, with whom I'd started an eBay business with in college, I like let him know of it. And then he's like, oh my God, this is so interesting. I'll help you set up an eBay business around this. You just pay for my uh, apartment in Miami beach and I'll work for you for free. Just pay for that. And then I'll come down to Miami and, and we'll set this business up. I was like, great. So he came down, we were going to start this coin business and a lot of things happened, but we ended up starting like this used sterling silver jewelry business anyway. So that proceeded on and on for the next like seven years, but the, but about another year into that, like I kind of had another like major crisis where I was like, okay, like, like I lit and it wasn't like a choice. It was like, I cannot go on because I was so stressed and depressed. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to liquidate this other kind of smaller business that I have just allow this more passive business that I have with my friend. I'll let that keep going. And then I'm going to get real serious about meditation. So then I started, you know, meditating every day, going to a local Zen group. And then I went up for, to do just self retreat at Bhavana Society up in West Virginia. And I remember talking like on a break, just talking to <clears throat> the cook and he had, and we talked a lot about a lot of stuff, but he mentioned Daniel Ingram and particularly was like, there's some crazy man in Alabama that's claiming to be like fully awakened. So I'm like, well, okay, well, I'm from Alabama that resonates and he's claiming like to be awakened and like, that's what I want, even though I felt, and you probably, if you relate with this, I felt like almost vulgar thinking, oh, you can really full on awaken. It's like, wow, like, you know, almost uh, 
anyway, whatever. So, um, so then I, I read Daniel's book and that really got me committed. So then I, I did, um, I did noting, I got really into Mahasi style noting for the next year and a, two and a half years. And then a year into that, I got a teacher, Abra Fournier, who was my teacher for like five years. Um, I'm kind of prattling a lot here. No, this is great. In? Keep going. Keep okay, going. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, and then, you know, I started uh, getting real regular about retreat. I do a, like five to 10 days of retreat every two months because again, like I out because this business that I had was, I wouldn't, it wasn't passive. I was, but it was only, it wasn't always full-time. I could kind of be part-time and it was also located in Dallas, whereas I was located in Miami. So the, I could like take breaks and meditate a lot, do retreat. So then, you know, I did a bunch of Galanka retreats. I did a bunch of Zen retreats and kind of my, um, uh, you know, kind of my decision-making process around what retreat was like, do I have the time? Is it cheap? Is it close? Okay, I'll do it. And so I would do retreats in any and all traditions that were available. Um, so yeah, and then my mental health did start improving kind of slowly. Um, I mean, I'm still quite neurotic, quite depressed and anxious, but it was like a lot more manageable. And also my, uh, you know, there were times that like, I was so depressed and anxious prior to that, that I just really couldn't work, couldn't kind of get it together to show up. Whereas I think my work product improved from, you know, with the support of the meditation. So that went on and on. I, I met my teacher, Abra, at um, the Buddhist Geeks, uh, conference I think in like 2012 or 2013 one of those and then so she became my teacher and then we met weekly for years and that was really supportive and then at some point I got exposed to Gary Weber and um, self-inquiry you know Ramana Maharshi style self-inquiry so then you know about two years into like this rededication to meditation I got into that and then for the next two years uh, my primary practice was self-inquiry. Um, not too much to say about that. Uh, that I will say that self-inquiry, I think, is a really good um, practice. It, it really changed things for me. And I think it also helped me kind of disidentify with a lot of my own suffering and kind of get perspective and, say, have deeper experiences. And incidentally, it's a, a practice that I teach and, and recommend to others. Um, let's see here. So then, and then after that period of like maybe two years of mostly self-inquiry, then I kind of became more eclectic, um, you know, kind of doing open awareness practices, um, also lots of heart practices, all, and then just to kind of to insert a comment, I, I'll say that I think in retrospect, I didn't do enough heart practices. And now when I teach, I recommend that people I mean, really, I recommend like 50-50, like that people do like 50% heart practices, 50% wisdom practices. Anyhow, so, okay, there's that. Then, um, okay, so then about three and a half years ago, um, I, like my, this like sterling silver, it's used sterling silver jewelry business of mine, like the market had changed and there were, and I think, I made mistakes, my business partners made mistakes, and then it failed. So then we wrapped up the business, um, or I wrapped it up about three and a half years ago. And then at that point, I'm like, okay, so I, I really want to get serious about, or get more serious about meditation, and then with the goal of becoming a meditation teacher. Uh, then as it all works out, uh, my dad died about three years ago. So just about half a year after I wrap up the business. So then I had a, so off and on, I've been working on his estate and, and he was an art and antique dealer. So it was like, he had a big bunch of art and antique that I had to work on selling. So, and I'm still actually in the process of that. Anyhow, <clears throat> so then um, at the beginning of 2019, I took the pathways, um, the Unified Mindfulness Pathways teacher training, which it was a good fit for me. I really, I did enjoy the, it, it, it really helped me. And what it did was it, you know, as part of the uh, a criteria for taking the course is like you have to teach and you have to put together like an eight week um, 
program on on mindfulness. And so like, I was like, okay, great. So I actually did it. And I found that giving these classes was really, um, it, it, it seemed like a natural fit. I really enjoyed it. it. Seemed like the response was pretty good. So then that was now about um, two years ago that I kind of gave this first um, eight week class. And then let's see here. Then also in 2019, I ended up moving to the, uh, the Hermitage. Uh, it's a meditation retreat center in British Columbia. So I lived there for four months and, and I kept giving classes online, you know, on the Brahma Viharas, et cetera. But then still all this time, I was still interested mainly just in meditation with this kind of with this awakening orientation and, and largely Buddhist, although, I've, you know, all the Advaita practices that are, have always appealed as well. So um, let's see here. So then I lived at the Hermitage for four months. Uh, and then uh, after the Hermitage, I did, well, a 10 day Goenka retreat, and then I did a 55 day Zen retreat. And then I came back to the US and then was kind of planning on really, well, I, need, I still needed to do a lot of work on the estate. And then, you know, I just wanted to kind of deepen things with, um, uh, teaching meditation. So I just like kept going with that. And, uh, and then, so, so here shortly, I'll get into the whole attachment um, piece, the attachment repair piece, but I'll make a couple other kind of contextualizing notes about um, meditation practice, et cetera. So I think you asked like what kind of practices I did and what kind of practices I teach. So I'd say the practices that I like teaching the best are self-inquiry, I really like Tonglen in terms of, a, you know, a, a, like a formal kind of Buddhist practice. So what else to say about that? Yeah, what I do like, you, what do you um, like, I, the, part of the reason I'm interested is I haven't done so much of either of the self-inquiry or uh -huh. the Tonglen for the, for the heart practices. I've done much more of the traditional uh -huh. metta and uh, have definitely read about both of those, but would just be curious to hear your own experience with those and, and, uh, what you like about those particular practices. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. um, so we can start with Tonglen. So Tonglen, I think, is really interesting it, because it's, uh, firstly, like the, there's a visualization element that's like more clear and explicit, right? Whereas, you know, let's say with some of the, uh, let's say the, the Brahma Viharas, it may or may not, like how explicit it is, maybe varies. So I like that part of it. Also, I think uh, the way that Tonglen is traditionally taught is like, it's also like there's this big wisdom element to, right? You, so you're taking on the suffering of all beings into yourself and like, uh, kind of like only, it, it only works well if you have this sense of emptiness of self. And then that, the, the ability to take on the suffering is kind of reinforces this emptiness of self, which I think is helpful. And then I just, I also just like how just generally like kind of like I feel it's like a very integrating practice is like you have these wisdom elements these hard elements um also there's this like perspective taking right it's like you're seeing how your suffering is not different from others you're seeing this connection between you and others um also and, and I view it as mostly a compassion practice like the compassion features most centrally to it and then just and this is a bit of a tangential note, but I think that for me, compassion really resonates there. Um, geez, let me see if I could articulate this. So I know that Ken McLeod talks about using compassion as this way to like kind of metabolize your, ex your, your whole life, like all the reactivity of your life that you kind of like you develop compassion and then you bring it to the reactivity of your life and then that kind of metabolizes it for you. So, and that kind of idea is appealing. And then I'm trying to get mentally organized around this. It's like, okay, so then maybe one reason why I like it is because, how to put this? So I think much of the task of spiritual maturation and growth as a human is, you know, coming into the negative aspects of your conditioning, your personality, and then 
working through them and transforming them. And, you know, I think you can do it through like Metta or through uh, Mudita, uh, Sympathetic Joy, but then like compassion already seems like, like <laughs> kind of like uh, 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 the fat, the fa what is it? The factory model or, you know, like, like it kind of like, you know, uh, like the, uh, it comes prepackaged already perfectly attuned to like working through suffering because that's what it's like the way i define compassion is it's what love does when it sees suffering so mm -hmm. it's like it, it really gives you this effective like angle in there so i think that that's another reason why i like uh tongue line so okay mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and then um about self-inquiry why do i like that i think well there's a couple of things about self-inquiry that i think are cool um one of the ways I like to teach it is that what you do is like often I think with other formal meditation practices, you have to like fight with your mind to settle it down and then and then like, you know, like kind of intend to like start working on a different groove and to just reinforce that groove. But then it's like there's like this tension between that that task and then the normal, let's just say default mode of the mind, which is just to be thinking about I, me, my, mine, and all my problems, right? But something cool about self-inquiry is that the way it was taught to me is that you wanna, um, you wanna like use self-inquiry in this like kind of like um, substituting way. So it's like you let your mind obsess on the thing that most of us obsess on, which is I, me, my, mine, and all my problems. But then you just like kind of insert this like in a sense fake thought almost of like self-inquiry and so you just can so you so you ride the natural inclinations of the mind but you just do this replacement that kind of was easy for me to do and so there's that and then also there's something kind of more I don't want to say philosophical but there's oh, it's more contemplative which that that contemplation also worked for me and so uh, those are some of the reasons why I liked it. And then, um, and then maybe one more piece to that is that, in a certain sense, you know, it's very much that Vajrayana uh, mood of turning poison into medicine, right? So, like the very thing that keeps you stuck is the very thing that you lean into to heal. And so you, you see that selfing and then you just replace and you just get right to that groove. And then like I kind of found that um, if you can kind of reassociate selfing with self-inquiry, then uh, I'm kind of repeating myself, but it all starts opening up quickly. And anyhow, okay. So then those are two reasons why I was, in, reasons why I was into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were there any other um, major chapters of your meditation history just as meditation? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. This is this one thing is coming up. Um, I think that uh, I, I like a lot of other people in the kind of pragmatic Dharma scene where I was always really obsessed with um, stream entry and awakening. Mm -hmm. And I remember that was really a driving force for me for years. And then at some point about five or six years ago, it quit being um, that something got resolved around that. Mm. Um, and then I think that's a bit vague, um, but there was all this tension around it and then it just, it just went away. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just, I'll say that. Um, are there any other questions around um, that or? Well, um, mostly it's just, it, it seems like uh, to transition into sort of the attachment repair stuff, it seems like uh -huh. from, from what I've heard you talk about it, like at a certain point you're like, oh, I've done all of this work of meditation and, oh, there, yeah. and there's still problems. So oh, yeah. you could tell me a little bit about that and how, how attachment sure. repair started to be the thing that you, you turned to after that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, so yeah, about I think a year and a half ago, I, um, I was talking to a friend of mine, Evan Lead, and he mentioned um, 
attachment theory and then particularly ideal parent figure protocol. And uh, I remember he was just like really excited about it. And uh, you know how it is, it's like you get exposed to something and like largely I think the response is like, oh, whatever, okay, well, yeah, okay, all right, sure. So I, I kind of didn't get it for a while, but he just kept going on and on about it. I just noticed he was very interested. Mm -hmm. And then he started talking about the different types of attachment styles and uh, like, especially the insecure attachment styles, um, like dismissing, preoccupied, disorganized. And then there was some resonance there. And then he sent me over a uh, ideal parent figure protocol meditation, uh, like a recorded version. And then it was like a month before I got around to do it. But <laughs> then when, when I finally did it, um, I was like, wow. Um, and then, so then he and I kind of like started just meeting just as friends. And uh, he spent like probably over the last, like over the last like 14 months, he, especially at the beginning, he probably spent about 50 to hundred hours just tutoring me on this just because he was into it. I like kind of was into it. I was getting into it. And so anyway, he started just telling me more and more about attachment theory and then um, ideal parent figure protocol. And yeah, so I finally got really into it. And then, so, and I'll kind of like, well, I'll set a little bit more context. So for the last like 14 months, that's been more or less all I've done is just studying attachment theory, uh, listening to talks about it, reading about it, doing ideal parent figure protocol. And, um, and it, it, well, it's made a big difference, but let, let me like kind of go back and like define some of the terms. Um, so attachment theory, the way I'd like to, like to think about it is that it, it, it kind of describes this dyadic relationship with, between the caregiver and the infant. And it usually, it's the primary caregiver is usually the mom. And so um, there's this kind of experience of connecting with the secure base with the mom. And then there's the experience of kind of, uh, you know, venturing away, exploring out. And then when you explore out, you know, the infant runs across things that are distressing and then the infant comes back to mom. And so that's, I think, in a nutshell, what attachment theory describes. And then what, what I think is why it's so important. So I'll kind of get into a little bit of detail as to why this is so important and further contextualized. So it happens at a, it ha like attachment conditioning is happening primarily between the ages of six and 20 months of age. And, um, and it's, this is really important to understand because at that, at that age, this is before narrative memory, like full on um, conceptual thought before that's really working. So, so attachment conditioning is more at this like behavioral procedural level of the mind. And as, an, as I was getting interested in it, I like really appreciated how important that was because I had done all this psychotherapy and I feel like I hadn't really moved this like deep conditioning. And like, I also had both this experience during, um, uh, during my whole kind of meditation career and my whole psychotherapy career or, or, or my experiences in psychotherapy, like I would get down to, down to like this kind of, let's say procedural level of the mind, but I didn't know what to do. I found it very distressing. And also I felt like I couldn't, it was not getting addressed by any of those techniques. Anyhow, so that was a bit of a deviation, but back to what um, attachment theory is. So these experiences condition you and you, you develop what's called an internal working model of attachment. And then this internal working model of attachment, um, again, it's at the procedural level of the mind and it kind of answers these questions for you. Um, is the world safe? Are others comforting? Can I just be myself and still expect my needs to get met? Do I need to modify myself uh, in, in my presentation to others? Um, am I a burden or am I a delight to others? Is a physical affection welcomed or spurned? Um, anyhow, so th this is kind of what this conditioning sets sets in motion. And, and I could I could think about it like a lens. This is the lens through which you see the world. And then incidentally, this this conditioning sets the foundation for your um, emotional regulation abilities, 
your relationship uh, development, and also your ability to, to explore and do self-development. Anyhow, so that's a little bit of what. Um, and as you were as you were diving into this, what what uh -huh. you know you were doing a lot of this work and learning about it, and uh -huh. what what kind of shifts did you notice in yourself as you were doing the ideal uh -huh. parent figure protocol? Okay, so well. Uh, Another way to answer this is like, what did I not notice improved during the whole meditation <laughs> and psychotherapy uh -huh. kind of practices? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I didn't feel really at ease with relationships. There mm -hmm. were a lot of times that I felt like a bit like an alien, you know, not at ease. Um, also, um, and more to that point, it was like uh, I had like a really narrow range of behaviors that I could engage with with others and be comfortable like i tended to like only like like i was a good explorer so i could like discuss with somebody else like these like kind of like little nerdy like meditation stuff or any kind of interest but then if it was just like kind of like hanging out and vibing i'd like immediately like be like uh like uh you know <laughs> and then this is again after like nine years of psychotherapy tons and tons of meditation and i just felt like an alien a lot of the times and then Something else was that, um, so I was diagnosed with ADHD, like when I was like 11 or 12, and all the meditation helped a little bit. I, I think that maybe the symptoms of ADHD were ameliorated by 50%, hmm. but then I still had a lot of ADHD. I had, I couldn't stay emotionally regulated enough to do, you know, like paperwork and administrative mm -hmm. tasks and so my life was still kind of a wreck and anyhow so so now since getting into like doing the ideal parent figure protocol and all this attachment repair like i feel a lot um a lot i feel that i'm at a lot greater ease with others mm. um like just vibing and just hanging out and not talking about anything in particular is like a um you know part of my behavioral repertoire now which it really wasn't in the past um and then and like also just ability to stay emotionally regulated to have like a difficult conversation with my fiance and it's like not a big deal and like like i just not taking things as personal anymore not feeling as wounded or like deeply rejected like mm -hmm. in the past you know, I've just felt easily rejected and easily wounded. Um, and then the other, so more on that point of like emotional regulation and um, ADHD that now uh, my ADHD is like much, much better. I think I don't, I wouldn't like uh, qualify. I wouldn't meet the standards of like a clinical diagnosis of ADHD now anymore. And so I can just like, you know, pick what I wanna do, stay concentrated enough to follow through. And so I've like, also there've been a lot of like, well, I've been able to like actually accomplish a lot more. So I like, uh, with the, the help of my friend, Andrew, we set up this website, um, attachmentrepair.com. I've put out a lot of um, courses. And so that that's, I think in a nutshell, um, some of the effects of doing this work. But let me also say that I'm for sure not done. And I, I still have, I'm, I'm sure of it, um, insecure attachment still. And, you know, I've got maybe another six months or a year to work. Um, mm. So, yeah. So say someone does get interested in this and like maybe they take your course or they're doing this work with a therapist or something like that. What What's kind of the journey for moving from an insecure attachment style to the secure attachment style? Like what are the interventions and, and you know, how long does it take and what exactly sure. do you do? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. So, um, well, the upshot, okay, so firstly, this was developed by Dan Brown. Uh, um, and Dan Brown lays this out clearly. So I can, I'll just kind of quote from him. Um, so people, well, let me just back up for a little bit more context. So there are three main, well, okay. Firstly about, and the, the research varies or the findings vary, but um, probably somewhere between 30 and 50% of the US population has insecure attachment. and then. Um, and then the forms of insecure attachment are um, dismissing attachment, preoccupied, and disorganized. I'll like very briefly define those, and then I'll talk about, speak more directly to your 
question about how long it takes to heal those. So sure. this missing attachment, um, geez, how to describe this. The people cope with their early conditioning by shutting down the attachment mechanism. And that's by basically shutting down the kind of what arises around anything interpersonal. So they just try to not be very interpersonal in a sense, right? And then with that comes a shutting down of emotions generally with the exception of anger. So they're kind of just generally shut down. They're not really in the body. Um, they tend to, yeah, kind of be a bit cold. The uh, dismissing attachment is in the more extreme forms is like associated with classical kind of narcissism. Okay, so that's dismissing attachment. Then the preoccupied attachment is where there's this hyper activating of the attachment mechanism. So there's this like clinginess around um, interpersonal relations, but then it's associated with anxiety. Um, and these people tend to be quite emotional, quite spontaneous. Um, okay, so that's a brief explanation of that. And then there's this organized attachment, which is also can be called fearful attachment. And then this is where, um, this is associated really with much worse outcomes. Um, a lot of uh, personality disorders are thought to originate with um, disorganized attachment. There's at least on the adult attachment interview to get, um, how to put this, diagnosed with disorganized attachment, you, you actually have to present both preoccupied and dismissing features at sufficiently kind of high levels to get scored. So there's like, like actually splitting, like there's like different parts of the personality that are really not fully integrated. And, um, and like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's like fear and generally a disorganized attachment is past the trauma line. That's the way that George Haas says it. Anyhow, okay, so then with that said, um, about healing it and, and how long and how difficult it is to heal. So um, this, this missing attachment, Dan says takes, or rather Dan says that it takes between 40 and 150 facilitated one-on-one -on -one sessions with inner, you know, and then in the interim doing your, like listening to the recordings maybe once a day in order to heal um, insecure attachment. Dismissing is the easiest. So let's assume that it takes somewhere between 40 and say 65 one-on-one -on -one facilitated sessions. Let's assume one session a week. So you can say one year to move from insecure dismissing attachment to secure, um, to secure attachment. Then for preoccupied, it's kind of in the middle. So let's just, let's just guesstimate like 60 to 100 sessions one-on-one. So, -on -one. so we're looking at one to two years. Uh, facilitated sessions of IPF with a facilitator, right? Um, and then doing the meditations in the interim. And then for disorganized, disorganized is the most complex and the most uh, difficult to work through. Um, and so it takes, let's just say somewhere between 80 and 150 sessions. So two to three years, we can say. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. And so tell me more about uh, ideal parent figure protocol and like why that's a really helpful intervention for this stuff. Okay. All right. Sure. Okay. So let's see here. Um, so ideal parent figure protocol, and I'll refer to it as IPF. Well, not quite as a mouth as a mouthful <laughs> that way. All right. So um, it's 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 a uh, it's a guided meditation, and Dan Brown and colleagues developed it. And so one way. And look, we'll kind of assume that the audience is somewhat meditation informed. So it, it's, it seems to be based on the elements of hypnotism. And then, but then it's largely based on Tibetan deity yoga. That's the way I understand it. And so what you do is you imagine ideal parents and then they just give you the five factors of secure attachment. They give you safety, attunement so the sense of being seen and understood um like that if you're angry or something they know that you're angry or yeah if you're right. sad they know that you're sad or that kind of thing exactly right mm -hmm. exactly um then they soothe you and comfort you they also delight in you 
So they express delight in you. And then they also support your self, self-development and exploration and play. And, and so you do this in a meditation with ideal parent figures that, you, that you're kind of hallucinating up. And then you do it and you're imagining yourself as a child. And then so that's kind of what it is, but then I think it, it'll be helpful to kind of contextualize it with, uh, let's say other therapeutic practices. Now mm-hmm. I'll say that this is, my understanding is that Dan largely developed this for psychotherapists. I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm a meditation teacher. Um, but um, so like, how does this relate with other, t- other g- general um, therapeutic modalities and then also even other attachment oriented um, attachment, uh, I'm sorry, uh, therapeutic modality. So firstly, um, I'll back up and say that one of the, one of the, if you have insecure attachment, Dan Brown recommends that you get that dealt with first, because that's like really the, the foundation of your psychological health. And also it's, it's something that he really emphasizes, which I think is so useful is he emphasizes how um, it's like you, you build on attachment conditions, almost most other thing, most the rest of your psychological development, particularly emotional regulation, relationship and um, exploration abilities all are, found, are like they rest on that foundation. So firstly, I think one of the things that makes um, IPF stand out is that you're focusing on the right thing. If you have insecure attachment, if you don't have insecure attachment, it's, it's you shouldn't focus on it. Right. And so, so to be clear that it's not just um, like, I, I originally got interested in attachment stuff because I was like, oh, relationships are hard, but it turns out that it's not just relationships that are affected by these, uh, these problems or solving them, but also like your general emotional regulation and also yeah. your ability to explore the world and learn things right. and, and try new things. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. 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 And so, and again, so what he's, really what he focuses on is like the point is that you focus on the foundation and you get the foundation settled and then you move on mm-hmm. so that's issue one issue two is so there are other you know there are other therapeutic modalities like let's say um adep aedp um i think it's accelerated experiential psychodynamic therapy i, I forget what it act like that's also um a, an attachment oriented psychotherapy but it's done between a therapist and a client. But then if you think about it, attachment conditioning doesn't have, it originates when you were an infant. So one thing, so what Dan kind of puts forth is that in order to, to in a sense, deliver the, the, the therapeutic modality, you want it kind of consistent with, you, you want this like developmental consistency. So the two adults, the one adult like kind of reparenting the other is like frankly strange like mm-hmm. it would be in my mind it's strange for me to be like oh tash and i just you're just wonderful you're a delight and it's like like i think now that can be done in a slightly less <laughs> over the top way uh-huh. and it can actually work uh-huh. but then what's cool about uh you know ipf is that it, it, it's freed from this like normal peer-to-peer interpersonal relationship like you're not going to be embarrassed by your parents exuding like lots and lots of joy about you. Mm-hmm. So it's like freed up in this way. Um, and then it's also kind of like developmentally appropriate. Like you have parents and then you're imagining that you're a child. So mm-hmm. it like mirrors actual attachment theory in that regard. Secondly, this point about like, it's it, like there are no, all the bounds and all, are freed up. Like if you're going to be my IPF facilitator, well, you're not perfect. You know, you're not always able to be there. Whereas I can imagine perfect I, ideal parents, right? And that's the point. So like the falling into the traps of disappointment with the facilitator don't happen as much because again, you're, you're imagining um, these ideal parents. Uh, thirdly, let's see here. Um, it is a guided meditation. And you know, there's research that points to how the mind is actually more plastic. Um, in in in, medit- in meditative states so i've just like this is this is anecdotal but like i can like feel something shifting and moving in the ipf meditation and then like for example doing psychotherapy when let's say the therapist is doing 
the job of the secure base really, really well. I can also kind of feel it, but it's just not as salient. So I think that like the delivery um, medium is also just really strong. And then the other thing is that, you know, 50 minutes once or twice a week isn't a lot, uh, a lot of time in, in psychotherapy and in order to repattern all this. So, you, you know, you take the meditation with you and you do formal sets where you listen to a recording during the week. And then, you, and then something I also recommend strongly is to do micro hits, right? That's a, you know, Shinzen Young term to just kind of do daily life practice where when you get emotionally dysregulated, you imagine the ideal parents come and soothe you when, you know, you're doing, <laughs> when you're doing a good job at something, you have your ideal parents like step in and, and congratulate you. Like, I always have my ideal parents marvel at how well I brush my teeth and how well I walk up and down stairs and, or any little silly thing. They're always happy about that. So anyway, you can just like kind of do a greater volume of the work. So I, I think I may have spoken to your question, mm -hmm. but is there more around that? Well, I could imagine someone, you know, I, I've heard you talk about this, but I could imagine someone hearing this and be like, well, you basically said you're hallucinating these imaginary yep. figures repeatedly with a meditation. Like, why is it that that would help at all? Like what, what's the sort of causal explanation for how that helps okay so uh well i have some thoughts around this and mm -hmm. um i think there may be other reasons why it works but the way mm -hmm. i think about it is that so your attachment conditioning happens at a time when your cognitive capacities are very poorly developed mm -hmm. um and the child is you know let's say at 12 at 18 months is totally magical right um so that part of the mind, which on some level seems to be intact and seems to operate in approximately the same way as it may have uh, during the attachment period, right? Between six and 20 months. Um, as I understand it, that part of the mind is psychically equivalent. And what does that mean? That means it does not know the difference between reality and um, imagination, which to be clear, psychic equivalence is largely a pathological state, like, right? I mean, you can go to the mental hospital if you don't, you know, that you'll be taken to the mental hospital if you don't know the difference between reality and imagination. But this part of the mind, which is very primitive, responds to it. And so maybe another comment around that is, and I think it's also really important for people to, you know, suspend their incredulity mm -hmm. and just let themselves be you know a two a three year old etc when they're doing this meditation and just take it on and then the other thing that i just simply add is um you know the results don't lie like it, it actually heals you so you know kind of who cares <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and there's and dan brown and others have done like solid yeah. research on that yeah. yeah right huh um yeah and can you, you know, there's this real emphasis on doing it with guided meditations. Can you talk about like what, what sort of, it seems like the, the basic components of the technique are, you know, you imagine yourself as a child yep. and you develop these figures that are like your ideal parents, yep. father, mother, that take care of you in all of these ways. Are there any other like key elements to it or, or, or things that are missing from that description or what are yeah. the components of it that are built in? Okay, so yeah, okay, so you imagine ideal parents, you imagine yourself as a child, and then you, um, and this is like one of the biggest pieces, just remember that the way that the ideal parents respond to you is always consistent with these five elements, it's these five factors of secure attachment. So they protect you and give you safety. They attune to you and give you the, the felt sense of being seen, being heard. They, they soothe you and then you feel soothed. They delight in you and you feel delightful and you start associating. And this is something that Dan really emphasizes. You start associating your sense of self with joy. And then you, thereby you build self-esteem. And then you, um, you also have them delight in your explorations. And then that like, kind of builds up your courage and your and since energy and, and, and good feelings around exploration. So if you can imagine ideal parents, come back to those five factors, then largely I think the I ideal parent figure protocol will go well. However, I know that George Haas recommends to 
do a few months of listening to the recordings or being facilitated yourself before you do the practice because what can happen is or rather what does happen is when you touch down into this touch into this um this early attachment conditioning um whatever is in there presents right because it's like this behavioral memory so it could kind of presents and you want to know how to shape it and you shape it in the direction of these five factors but you're actually kind of like repatterning and reshaping it and so you need to ha to have enough experience and like develop the intuition around when to go with something that's arising versus when to kind of repattern it and, and shape it towards these five conditions is that speaking to your question yeah yeah and that, that brings up part of why i'm asking because in my own experience learning this technique it's been really different than a lot of the other techniques that i've learned in that um well one there's a lot of different it seems like every different guided meditation I've heard is just radically different, oh. of, you know, like different components. And yeah, they have the ideal parents and so on, but there's yeah. a lot of different like angles that you can take it. And then sure. um, also just, oh, I don't know if you tell someone uh, feel the sensations of the breath at the abdomen or the nostrils uh -huh. or something yeah. like there are different approaches that you can take to that, but that's also something you can just go and do yourself. And yeah, sure. it's sort of like self encapsulated, but this, this has a lot more like nuance and complexity to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, I don't know if this is speaking to your comment, but mm -hmm. like um, uh, another kind of, let's say heuristic for doing the IPF is this concept of like positive opposite. So Dan, talks a lot about positive opposite so mm -hmm. one okay so like stepping back and it's like okay how would i recommend someone come at ipf like like be kind of doing all their homework getting everything really perfectly well set up well best practice would be to actually take the adult attachment interview figure out what your attachment conditioning is and then certain you know these certain these different types of attachment conditioning and kind of keeping it simple like uh dismissing preoccupied disorganized they uh what needs to be emphasized is different and largely the emphasis is can be understood as like what is the positive opposite of this conditioning so let's just go with dismissing so and then incidentally like dismissing is like the easiest attachment style to understand so Largely dismissing attachment comes from the consistent experience of the infant's attachment bids, attachment needs getting rejected. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean the child was rejected completely. Like, you know, one assumes that largely, you know, you got your physical needs met, you know, like food, safety, shelter, et cetera. But then this like, this natural pre-programmed right pre-installed desire to like connect with your parents and mm -hmm. and then like you know have your emotions seen be be soothed etc that that generally makes the primary caregiver uncomfortable because of their generally dismissing attachment conditioning and so then those needs aren't getting aren't met so the way that you cope with that is you shut down your needs and you deny that you have attachment needs and you just in a sense don't look at it and you dismiss them well so but now what's the positive opposite of that it is um ideal parents who are at complete ease with your attachment needs with your desire to connect with your desire to be seen and then also particularly in the case of dismissing attachment one thing that dan says is that there tends to be a pervasive misattunement to uh, negative affect. And so people with dismissing attachment, um, they're misattuned with around their negative affect. In a sense, they pick up on how mom, generally mom, finds it um, threatening. So they learn to not present negative affect. They have it, but then they suppress conscious awareness of it and like kind of present like all smiley, like everything is okay. But actually beneath consciousness, there's all this upset and turmoil and sense of rejection. So then what do we do? We have the ideal parents give the positive up. So it's like, like they really attune also to your upset and they convey that it's completely okay to be upset, to be angry, to be sad. 
and they they comfort you and soothe you. So that I think that somewhat speaks to the question. Uh, well, that just gets a little bit more fine grain about some of the instance of logic that dictates how to run the IPF itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And from you know from the per, sort of circling back to the the meditation angle, like why is it that this you know given all this work that you've done now and the learning that you've yeah. done like why is it that this stuff is needed and you know traditional contemplative practices don't hit these angles uh -huh. like, what why is this needed in your experience mm, okay well um so i think for some people it's not needed at all mm. actually like right like if you have secure if you have like let's just say prototypically secure attachment um then you don't need to do this work and for those people they tend to do really well with meditation. And I'm sure that uh, <laughs> you probably know some of those people. Uh, and I certainly have known them. And it's like, you know, I'm envious of like, oh my God, things just like really went well for them. Like, you know, they started practicing and like, you know, a month into it, they're getting all these deep experiences. And, you mm -hmm. know, I'm still like struggling, you know, <laughs> three years into it. Anyway, right. so those people don't need it, firstly. Uh -huh. um, and so again, it's, um, let's see here. But but maybe like, why is it that other meditation practices don't address this? So mm -hmm. I think most meditation practices are gonna, like they're certainly gonna be consistent with moving you towards secure attachment. I just don't think they're very directed. Like the mindfulness, mindfulness practices, Vipassana, obviously help with you know the development of wisdom and then the development of like metacognition, mm -hmm. which, you know, this ability to reflect on yourself, reflect on others, et cetera. But then that is, is helpful and that, that, that helps with your attachment conditioning, but that doesn't address the internal working model of attachment itself. It gives you kind of this like fluency and wisdom and, and understanding for yourself and others that helps kind of, I like to think about it like keep you out of the ditch, but it doesn't really fix your attachment condition. Now, with that said, I do think that there are, there are meditation practices that I think if you do enough volume of them, like traditional practices, that uh, you could you could move from insecure to secure attachment. I think that the heart practices, if you do, you know, like we're talking about, you know, two, three, four thousand hours, I think it's enough to move you from insecure to secure. So mm -hmm. incidentally, um, also to further contextualize this. Um, it's my understanding, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I, as I understand it, Dan Brown views IPF done to completion as the equivalent of Nundro. And um, so Nundro is, um, are, the, are the preliminary practices in Tibetan Buddhism mm. where you do five 100,000 sets of um, Jami Vajrasattva mantra, um, prostrations, um, and, and, and there are other practices as well. It works out to be about 1700 hours of practice. And he says that they're somewhat equivalent, but most people don't know about Nundro. Most people are not gonna do Nundro. Also, attack, this, this work is like very specific and pointed. Like, like you can really tell uh, the way that Dan and his colleagues developed this is like very pointed at fixing this early attachment conditioning. Um, but you know what? I don't think I'm really ask, answering your question. Could you ask it again or, or, or take another shot at it? Oh, I think, I think you answered it. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm hearing both in what this and what you said earlier about doing like 50-50 of heart and wisdom practices. Yeah. Like, would it be fair to characterize what you're saying as really succeeding in meditation practice and contemplative practices will benefit from doing this kind of attachment repair oh, yeah. and heart-based practices to start with? Oh, definitely. Well, mm -hmm. certainly. Now, but again, this is assuming that you don't have optimally good psychological health coming into mm -hmm. meditation. Right, practice, if you're not- Which most people don't, attachment style, right? right? right. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing that probably, well, firstly, I think there's a lot of self-selection for people that have like mental problems that get totally. into meditation. I mean, you know, you're not getting into this because you're brilliantly happy. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, but so for people like that, like the way I would view IPF and attachment repair is like, if you have insecure attachment, do this work first and then everything will unfold pretty smoothly thereafter. So yes, absolutely. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and so um, 
tell me a little bit about your course. You're starting some new cohorts soon. Yep. Of your course, tell me about that and how people sign up and what that involves. Sure, sure. Um, let me let me see if I can bring it up. Yeah. So, um, I'm starting a new um, eight week attachment repair class. This could be mainly focused on um, ideal parent figure protocol. It starts on. Geez, let me see here. Uh, Tuesday, the 30th um, of March. That's so about like uh, almost 10, like 10 days away or so. And uh, yeah, so we're just going to go over the basics of attachment theory, um, the basics of how to do IPF. Every, every, uh, every class will do uh, most, well, most classes we do an IPF meditation guided, then people can get the recordings and keep listening to it lecture, Q&A, et cetera. Then what else about this? Oh, it's incidentally, it is um, donation basis. So people can just donate whatever they want. Um, let's just I'll take a minute and go into some of the details. Oh, we go over like an actual treatment plan of like, okay, what does this look like? How, you know, what are the phases of how do I move through IPF and get um, secure attachment? Um, the content is, let's see here. So the basics. Then we go a lot deeper into the four types of um, attachment conditioning, secure, dismissing, preoccupied, disorganized. Then we go into metacog metacognitive, um, the, uh, the development of metacognition. So really being able to identify our own emotions, identify the emotions in others, see how there's these interplay, et cetera. Um, Oh, we also talked about the last class we focus on collaboration. Collaboration, yeah, the ability to collaborate is also um, impaired in people with insecure attachment. So we talk about that and talk about how to repair that. Um, yeah, um, that's what's coming up right now. Any any other questions around it? Or no, just uh, I'm really glad you're offering that, and it's a seems like a really practical way to actually dive into this stuff and and make it. Uh, so that we can repair our attachment sure. style. So yeah, thanks for thanks for that and for talking with me today. Yes, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Tasha.